Yeah. So am I. So am I. And I'm going to be in charge of this if you want to. Just say so, and and uh, I'll click it. Go ahead, click it. Today we're going to be talking about the celebrating All Souls Day, honoring our ancestors, Jesse Pinto Sr. My okay. dad. So you you can if you want me to read along, I'll do that. If you want me to do that. <laughs> All reservations in San Diego County take the day to remember our ancestors. And early, as I can remember, my female, female ancestors began early in the year to make flowers a place on the graves of family members. I was told to make them look pretty. You're addressing them up. All Souls Day, we prepare a meal which our ancestors join us in spirit. <clears throat> Candles are placed at the head of the grave sites. We would always place four on each site until one day with Jane Dumas, whom old tribal elder, said to me, do you think you can hold a candle by their feet? So now I will use two candles. The candles lit at dusk are meant to show the way back so they will not get lost. It is a sight to see when you light it up. We do that on November 2nd. But the other part of it, too, is that, you know, that we're talking about religion here a little bit, you know, because that's how it all came about, you know, some of the the Catholic religion kind of relates into this this All Souls Day. But we used to call it Rook. When uh, when somebody passed away, they made a, a doll that would, maybe if it was possibly me, they would make it resemble me with the hair and the teeth and all of that. And it would look real because once you did that, that person would carry that person around with you, or that, that, that uh, doll, it would carry it with you. I mean, it was like that person was with you. Uh, this was a year later after this, had, you know, after the person that would die, they do a group dance where they, but anyway, that was to show that that person was there with you. And, and, uh, and when, uh, came to an oh yeah so when you were having dinner or something or eating at that time you would have that doll there right there with you sitting and, and participating and eating together with this person so when all of that's over they would take that doll and they would burn it and i'll tell you some of that was dolls i, I don't know if you've been up to southern indian health council if you go up to southern indian health council up in alpine there's uh, three dolls there and you can go in there and look at them. They have shells for teeth. I mean, it's kind of a scary thing to look at sometimes, but that's just to show that that person that you're celebrating with, excuse me, celebrating with is either a relative, real close relative, that's why you're the one that's carrying it. So that was one of the, it's called the crook. And uh, I just wanted to relay that a little bit because, you know, before, Catholic and church set into our our culture, we were doing these other things, you know, but where the non-native people probably thought that's a little, little strange, little not, you know, that's why Catholic religion came into our play, you know, that, that that's what we did. My mother, my grandmother, all of those guys grew up Catholic religion. And when I got to my age, uh, I wasn't in favor of it too much. I hope I'm not speaking against anybody by doing that, but but uh, that's how I feel these days. So when I pray, I don't say God, even though there is a certain, either female or male, I don't, a creator that created all this. So I call him the creator when I speak, when I pray, and that's what I'm speaking of when I, it could be God, I don't know, but this person or this being created all of this for us to to live water air all the animals humans that's why I feel that uh, when I say creator that's what I'm speaking of everybody all of us all of the world all of that's living that's what I mean when I say creator so okay oh boy here we are uh, you can see over here this I don't know if you've been down 94 going towards Ducati or Mexico. This is 94 that goes down there to the east. That way you're going back to San Diego. This is the casino we just, we're about three years old now, but I don't want to talk about that. 
this is the reservation that we still have right here, which Percy helped us uh, obtain from the bishop, from the church, the Catholic church. And uh, all those years, I don't want to tell you how old I am, but all the years I was going there as a kid and Carlene, we would decorate the, the crosses, just like we just, I just read there, that we do that every, every year, I remember as a kid. And uh, all those years that we were there doing that, um, I'm sorry to say that, yes, we did have services there with the Catholic priests once in a while, but after a while that stopped, didn't, didn't take place anymore. And uh, the non-Indian people back in the 50s, maybe the early part of the 60s, were using that church, the community church. Our church was all of Hamul in that area in that time. But when they built their new church, they kind of abandoned us and after that. They didn't. Well, it was terrible. The road from down here all the way to the church was dirt road. You came up a hill and you went down a hill. And if it rained, it was terrible. You couldn't pass through that. So, so that's probably one of the reasons they said, uh, we'll go to this church. But anyway. Uh, <laughs> But that was the hard part of it, you know, going, going, getting to that church. But all those years that we were there, we took care of that church. We maintained it. We made sure that the graveyard was clean all the time. We, you know, we have uh, graveyard cleaning in the latter part of May, and that's when we go in there and just clean all the brush up and make it really nice looking so you can see, because the brush this year was up this high. We had to go in there and chop them all down and clean it up it's really nice to clean now but that's what we do once a year too is clean the graveyard make sure everything's because when I go I hope to have somebody maintain my area too and make sure that they don't forget me and that they know who it is that's laying there me but uh the other thing was that I wanted to mention was that <clears throat> yeah we took care of that church and we took care of everything that needed to be taken care of but never once saw the Catholic Church come in there and say hey this is our church this is our land let us do something for you. Let us renovate. Let us rebuild the church that came to that point. But that never happened. We did it all ourselves. We just, just lately, just in the last couple of weeks, put in a new floor. You know, because if you go in there and look at the church at the beginning part of the porch area, I guess you want to call it, as you go into the entrance, you can look up on the beams there. And you can see that some of those beams were handmade. They weren't nice tools or anything. These were the hand tools. Then they put it in there. You can see it. It's just obvious that that wasn't manufactured wood. And, and they just probably found it somewhere. Let's use this beam here, you know. So they did that. But we've been taking care of it. It's looking really nice. We just brought new doors for it. The pews, all of them, we uh, all cleaned them up, sand them down. They're really presentable. We're trying to make our, our first uh, uh, services there in the next couple of I guess in the next couple of months because we're still doing the parking lot too. We're doing the parking lot there with a big fireplace that's going to be right there. Because when you have, uh, when, I don't want to wish anybody in our tribe bad luck, but when we have funerals, it's usually awake, stay up all night, sing songs, and uh, get prepared for the next day for burial. <clears throat> so um, <clears throat> anyway, I brought that part up because that's that's what we do normally traditionally that we do have a we have a wake and uh, and we continue to do that but right now we're we're kind of telling everybody please stay healthy <laughs> and uh, stay with us for a while and uh, what else <sighs> I just we've had this church like I said quite a year quite a number of years and you can see I never knew it when I was a kid that it was St. Francis Xavier Church. I didn't know that because down the road it's St. Uh, uh, St. Pius the Tenth. You know that's the church, but I never knew as growing up that it was St. Francis Xavier Church. But anyway, this is just showing a little bit of the history of how this all came to be for us, and you can see the year there. What's this? 1932. 1912. Okay. Built yeah, because because uh, there's a cross. We have this big cross right there, and it says 1913 on it. So, so I, I imagine this was right before all of that was put up. But um, and that's that's what I have for right now. 
I just and there's our grant our deed I mean and uh, this was just happening like I said uh, Percy paid paid a lot of attention to us and letting, uh, letting her know that we have this church here we explained to her the whole history of it when I'm explaining to you guys and um, she happened to know some people made some connections and helped us obtain this land and uh, lo and behold the bishop of the diocese turned that land over to us it's our land now it's not in trust but once it's in trust that's I feel that's going to be really our land but right now it's ours and they gave it to us without any strings attached without any price attached to it all it was just out of the blue that he gave it to us and we've been thankful for that for that bishop to do that and for Percy for helping us to get this all set up for us and uh, I just can't you know thank her enough for her efforts and all the contacts and all the people that she knew to to make this move along for us tonight. I thank you, Percy. Thank you. Okay, it was established in the community. Indian Cemetery is once owned by the Catholic Diocese, I just mentioned. This photograph was taken around 1930. Often showed is still in use today. The altar, I'm sorry. Um, yeah, so we pulled all of that down, so like I said, we, we did the whole wall, the church itself, and now we did the floor with tile, and uh, really solid now. And uh, underneath you that church, the, when we uncovered it, and take the wood up. You can see the holes in the wall in the back of the church where it was just bare. It was just wood right there, so you could see outside. But this, this church has been there for a while that... Uh, We've had coyotes go underneath there, had puppies. We had a whole mess of coyote puppies coming out of there one time. And, uh, and a real nice rattlesnake den, because a couple of times you'd see rattlesnakes come from underneath the church also. But uh, like when they tore the floor apart, this, you could see all the, uh, all the uh, animals, dead carcasses from previous animals. But uh, it... <sighs> So when we did that floor, I'm glad we got it done. It's really looking nice now. And like I said, we were going to try and have our first services in the next couple of months. And, and uh, if you wish, I'd like to invite you all out there, if you could, come and visit us. But anyway, that's, that's what our church used to look like. It was, wow, it was in tatters. It was just getting ready to fall down. And if somebody was to set a match to it, it probably would have went up real quick. That's just what I'm talking about on November 2nd. We light candles. That's what it looks like at nighttime. We do it right at dusk. You can see it's still a little daylight. Sometimes it may be so windy that we can't do it. Or it may rain. We may push it over to the next day or the following weekend maybe. But sometimes it'd be so windy, I swear to goodness, it'd be so windy and by the time dusk got around, it would be still. So that would give us a chance to go around and light all the candles up. And that happened a few times I've seen that and it just that was just like to me I think that's a miracle for us to be able to get that done because the ancestors are waiting for us to do it so we do it we get it done and then all of the all of the decorations on the crosses everybody goes and does it individually if it's family they do their own but lately a lot of families are gone and so a lot of us have to take the the uh, slack up by building more flowers making more flowers for the rest of the, the cemetery because this cemetery like i said has been there since probably 1913 1912 and there's graves that are there that are so old that we we don't know who they are <laughs> but they've been there for a while so we still take care of them you know we even have we even have a non-indian person there it's a young boy and uh You know, we're a poor tribe. We didn't have a lot of stuff, but when we see somebody in distress like this young family was, that they didn't, couldn't afford to take their child to have it buried somewhere in a cemetery. And uh, her grandmother happened to take, answer the phone for this young lady calling, saying, I've been trying to get my child buried, and 
nobody's accepting me and I don't have the money and and she goes how many days has this been now and she told her I think a few weeks or something and, and she just you bring that baby here you bring him here and we'll have services for him and and we have him up there now so and the family we didn't see for quite a while and then now they're starting to come back they're non-Indian people this is what we do we take care of it and they were so proud to come back and see that the cemetery or where their brother was laying was clean you could see his face it wasn't dirty we make sure that when he's in our cemetery we're going to be taking care of him no matter who he is young or old we're going to take care of that and that's what we do too but anyway that was a sad story but like i said there's times that we're going to find somebody out there that can't afford to do some of this stuff and we're gonna we're gonna help you we're gonna help as much as we can to get that person to rest and have have peace but it, like I said the cemetery has been there for a while it says here Spreckles also donated a small piece of land so we could visit where our ancestors were buried and that's part of the land where we're at now and does everybody know who Mr. Spreckles is <laughs> Mrs. Spreckles is sugar maintenance. Yes, yes. Isn't it kind of ironic that I don't eat sugar? I mean, I can make everything about me, <laughs> but I don't eat sugar. And the Spreckles guy was the one who donated land a long time ago for the tribe to bury and it, people. It's something. And when that came into play, it was a young kid. It was one of my uncles. He said, Hey, I want you to start from here, run up that hill and run across over that way and run back over here and all of that land that you just measured out by running around that whole perimeter that's yours and my uncle tells us he went up there and he thought he was just a kid he thought he picked out a big chunk but it was only about six acres that he picked out for us but uh but that was part of the cemetery too so mr Spreckles allowed him to do that and that's how that land became a even though before Mr. Spreckles was there and came and said that land's mine, we were living on that land. You know, we were living there and people, even today, they go, we have Indian people in Hamul. You know, how's, how's that happen? <laughs> they, they didn't know it. But I wanted to tell you too, also Hamul, you know, some of the tribes out here, Viejas, Verona, now you come to Hamul, Hamul, which means in our language, water, sweet. Ha means water, mul means sweet. So water, sweet, because we speak backwards in our language, but it, it, you know, sweet water. But uh, I think we're unique. We're, we use our name, our, our language, and some of these other guys, you know, <laughs> they got Verona. That's not an Indian word, but I mean, I'm just joking. I just give them a little problem. But anyway, that's, 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 I think Hamul is unique when we have that. We can uh, be identified with our tribal name and, and our language. So anyway, it was once told that the first burial was a white man. He gave us covered with rocks, which is there. Most recently, documents were found that, that stated was the first known leader, Kamiai or Kamiai, who was first buried at the cemetery. One of our first known leaders. Could have, could have been my grandfather, her grandfather, could have been one of those people, but a lot of our, I, I'd like to talk on the Pinto side that we, we do speak for the tribes, we speak for ourselves, we speak for our tribe, and, uh, and I guess we've been told that we are, the Pintos are speakers and, and, and leaders, and I, I like to be identified like that, because now my daughter, my dad, Tony Pinto was a uh, tribal leader on his reservation pretty much all his life. Even though he went to World War II, he came out. He was tribal leader for that tribe for the longest time. He passed away about 10 years ago or so. But I mean, that just tells me, and I have a professor from, I forget, Wisconsin. He knows my family really well, or my aunt and my dad, because he was a shadow. He was a young gentleman that went around with them all over the place learning getting insight from what what we did the culture identifying our culture and they told him when he left that we gave you information 
It's like a puzzle. Now go put it together and come back and share it with us. And every one of them are gone now, my aunt and my dad and all those guys. But that professor, he came back and he met my family. We, I, I like to call him my brother because he's a really, really knowledgeable person. Speaks our language. I can't believe it because he hung around with my aunt and my dad. And, and he just identifies certain things that are in our language. And I'm just listening to him. I go, gosh, he sounds so, so real. Which he, <laughs> I mean, really speaking our language, it was just the sounds that he was making. It was just, it was, it was correct. And uh, so he is coming back here, hopefully in uh, August. No, it's the end of this year. We're going to share a plant that's out there that we use to smoke as tobacco, and he's going to introduce it back to the Kumeyaay people. But I told him I didn't want him to do that until we could all get together, my family, because we wanted to be a part of that first before we share it with all the tribal members because that's where it came from and he was gonna say, he was gonna share it with me because my mom, my, my aunt, my dad, all of those guys showed him that. They showed him where to look, what to look for, and this is what you do with it. So he came back and he says, I got that information and do you want me to share it with everybody? And I was kind of being selfish, I think, a little bit there by saying, no, I don't want you to. I don't want you to share it with them right now. I want you to share it with my family first, then we'll introduce it to the whole tribe. So we're gonna do that here, possibly at the end of the year or at the beginning of the next year that we're gonna go out and find this tobacco and share it with everybody, and let them know what it is. And then when we use this, it's in a ceremonial way. It's not, oh, let's smoke it up, you know? No, it's gonna be a ceremonial type smoke when you do this. <clears throat> yeah, this uh, gravesite over here is uh, one of our great, grave sites of my daughter and her mom, her grandmother, and her mother. These are families, and you may notice that we just found pictures lately of them. One of them was kind of faded out there, but we, we got it enough to put in there and, and be able to recognize who they are. <clears throat> the flowers I make for them while working, I think about who they were. I wish I'd have known these strong women. All Souls Day is a special day for me and as I celebrate in their honor because uh, you know you hear about domestic violence and all this stuff well you know what mothers are sacred grandmothers are sacred they're the ones that gave us life and that's why when we look and talk about the earth we call her mother earth she gave us life she gives us life so that's what we look at when we talk about our ancestors and the women that really worked hard to keep them alive and they themselves survive because it was a hard life for, for women. And um, that's why we hold them very dear to our hearts these days, that uh, grandmothers, mothers, sisters, aunts, they're all sacred. They're all sacred people. And uh, I'd like to just touch on that a little bit. Go ahead. These are old tribal members. They're gone, but they used to sing the bird songs. One of them's there is a uh, great uncle here, John Kice. I remember him when I was a small kid. Mr. George Hyde. He's a uh, he's a uh, Quichon Kukapa. I forget. Is it Kukapa? Kukapa. Kukapa. And he came to Manzanita Reservation. Lived there all his life. And the tribe uh, adopted him. So he was a tribal member for Mazanita after he left the Pucham, I mean the Kukupa tribe. And over here is my uh, Chris Pinto. It's my dad's brother. He, they all used to sing songs. So the, and, and, and where they're at right now, <laughs> that's our old community building. And you can see all the walls are not really got drywall on it or anything or plywood on there just to it was just a building put together real quick and it was used for multi-purposes, uh, dinner, birthdays, celebration of some sort. And then when we do have wakes, this is where we came down to eat, spend all night there. 
sometimes. But uh, yeah, and my uh, my uncle Chris there was uh, one of the <laughs> one of the uh, Indian police up in Campo area that had to back back then and back in the I want to say the forties maybe maybe the fifties. He was one of the Indian police up there. He's a real tall guy. He was the guy he wanted to mess with. And he said, you're under arrest, you better go. Because that's what he was. He was a, one of the Indian police. But anyway, I just thought I'd throw that in there. This is one of our council members. That's Terry Cousins. <laughs> <laughs> that's Erica Pinto. This is our tribal attorney. And that gentleman, I don't know. But anyway, those are the people that are... If they were asked, they would transfer the property to the tribe, and that's what we did. We asked them, and and they did it. I was, I'm, I'm still, it's boggling my mind, and surprising to me that the church did that for us. I think that was really a good gesture on their part after all these years of, I think, neglecting us. You know, even though they say, hey, we're Catholics, and why are you not going over here and doing services and taking care of the church? You know. We did it all ourselves. <coughs> Gosh. That's Mrs. Chamberlain there. I don't know if that was appropriate for her to put the bishop's hat on like that, but she did. And so we all kind of like, oh my gosh. So I hope he didn't, he didn't seem to care, I guess. He was all right. Well, that's Bishop McElroy. Bishop and, McElroy. And he allowed my mom to do that as a celebratory. That was the day that they came and they blessed the cemetery. And we had bird songs. But I, can I say something a little bit backing up? Go ahead. Here? So this is William Nolan. He's the attorney for the Catholic Diocese. That's Carrie Patterson. She's our uh, longtime tribal attorney for 10 years. She's Seneca Indian. That's me not paying attention as usual. And there's uh, my cousin, Terry. As he mentioned, Percy, uh, you know, bridged those gaps between you know, the people that we were trying to get our land from. And she made these contacts for us. We went there in 2017, and it was on my birthday. I remember we submitted this long letter, and we wanted, we were begging, I feel like, for our land back. We wanted it so bad because, like my dad mentions, we've taken care of them for centuries, for, for years. And with no help from anybody, we've done it. My mom's done it, my dad's done it, His, their parents have done it, and their parents' parents. So it was very meaningful. And when that happened, and they came to bless the cemetery, she decided to put the hat on to celebrate this. It was a beautiful day. It was just a beautiful day. And, um, oh, I don't want to get to that part yet. But I, I do want to make some comments about November 2nd, because I consider myself fairly young. My mom doesn't <laughs> consider me young, but I've learned from my mom, and I've learned from my dad, that when we do November 2nd, you know, yes, it's a Catholic religion, yes, it's, and you have some tribal people that look down upon the people who do believe in Catholic or Catholicism or, or Christians because the history between, you know, what the missions did to the people and enslavement and the murders. But you know what? I, I'm a different person, I guess, because if my parents believe in this way, maybe my dad does it, but my mom does, and I highly respect that. And that is their choice to believe in the way that they want to, and I'll believe in the way that I want to, and they respect my beliefs. So um, we decorate the graves, we put on beautiful flowers, you know, in, in honor of them, because we're honoring them. We have people that are non-Indians there that we take care of, as my dad mentioned. And then when we're done, we light the candles, and we go and eat, which is our favorite part. Because <laughs> truly, when you think about it, when you're there, as she mentioned in one of the slides, when she's making her flowers, she's really thinking about the people that she's making them for, and just getting in that moment of, you know, maybe we didn't know them, but they were strong women. They survived. Survived so many things, diseases, and domestic violence probably, substitute, a bunch of violence. They survived all these years, and it's, it's just so, um, I don't even know the word to think about that when I look at any tribal person, for that matter. When I, yesterday, the county of San Diego proclaimed um, the second Monday of October, Indigenous Peoples Day, you know, instead of celebrating Christopher Columbus, who came and he, uh, um, I should have put that picture in there, but anyways, uh, you know, what Christopher Columbus did to the people, too, you know, it's, it's just a shame, and when I look at the tribal people, when I look at my mom, when I look at my dad, when I look at any tribal person, even Barone, I love Barone, I love Saquon, but um, they're just all miracles, 
all of us are miracles because we should not be here. We should not be alive. We were meant to be killed. We were meant to be exterminated. So I, I take pride in the cemetery, and I take pride in knowing that my people were so resilient. My mom was resilient. My dad's resilient. You know, he had some horror stories about his stepdad that beat the crap out of him. And um, so I, I just, I go up there and I walk with my mom. And as I get older, I found this new respect and appreciation because I, you know, I stopped being a little brat. Not yet. But, <laughs> but uh, I just have that newfound love and respect and appreciation. And so when we're eating dinner, you know, my mom tells me that our relatives are there with us. So they're there with us, they're enjoying our company, and we're all together in this room. And she built this beautiful community center on, on the reservation. If you ever come out there and get a chance, we'll show you around. So the last slide, I do want to share, I just want to share my thoughts about that. Mom, did you want to share anything? Okay. So the last slide is about Percy. Percy was responsible, and I'm going to say it how many times, five or six times, but Percy has been <laughs> responsible for the Catholic diocese and the action that they took for giving us our land back. And it's long overdue. Mm. So because Percy did this, and she, for whatever reason, she has her lives, I think things are meant to happen. And I don't know the word for that, serendipity, serendipity <laughs> or something. <laughs> but I just wanted to honor Percy here today because she did this for us. And now our ancestors are with us, and they're not under the, the rule of the Catholic diocese. Not that I have any hard feelings with that, but they're now <laughs> ours. They're now ours and with us. And so I wanted to give this to you. But before she does that, oh, yes. it was just that, you know, we, we, we didn't get a chance to really uh, put our feelings forward to, to, to know that we really did appreciate what he did for us. I, Thank you. I think. lucky to have somebody like Percy here. Yeah. He's a strong ass woman. <laughs> strong. I'm gonna have a t-shirt made. <laughs> so I wanted to honor you. Oh my god. Oh. 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 oh my god. I didn't and wow. thank you for what you've done for yes. us. I appreciate wow. you so oh much. I just want to say, um, when Antonieta was planning this event, I, the only person that popped into my head was Carlene. And Carlene is a very humble woman. She hasn't said five words <laughs> today. Um, but when I That's heard real. her, <laughs> That's right. she's humble. She's a humble woman. And every time I'm around her, I always learn something. And her relationship with her daughter, I mean, I just pray. I told her this last time. I just pray that my relationship with my daughter is like this someday. Um, but you know, when she talked about her cemetery, the love that she has for, for, the, for the cemetery, for the people that are there, I mean, it was, it was like I could t like taste it and feel it and smell it. And I think, you know, just speaking for myself as a Native person, um, you know, some of us have a hard time with death because we attend so many funerals for people that are so young. Um, and leave way before their time. Um, so I know like with my family, we have a hard time, but you know, talking with Carlene has helped me to see like that passing is something that is natural and that our people had our own ways of um, dealing with that. And I think the Western world came and really changed what that means for us. Um, and I just, you know, just wanna just say that what Hamol is doing in the cemetery, I mean, definitely take her up on the offer, go out there. Because um, it's beautiful. I was just there last week, and 
Yeah, I was admiring the retaining wall, and I said, oh, when did you do this? And then Carson said, well, last time you were here, there were weeds, so you probably didn't see it. <laughs> so, I mean, it's just beautiful, and the amount of work that they put into it is amazing. Um, so, a big round of applause for them and everything that they've done. Thank you. Thank you. So, really, if you want to, come on out there to, uh, to uh, Hamul on November 2nd. You can get there around about maybe four o'clock, three, four o'clock, and then about five, six in that area. If it gets dusk and, and it's dark enough, we'll start lighting up the candles. And you can come out there and, and see what we did. Like the like like I showed you the, how the crosses were all decorated. Everything is just going to be nice and pretty with flowers. And then when we do that too, we we look at it in a way too is that we're bringing them new clothes, new shirts, new dress for them to wear for that day. You know for maybe the rest of the year until we do it again. But that's one of the things, that's another way we look at it too, that when we do this, that we're, we're dressing them up, getting them new clothes that make them look good for the day and feel good. And, uh, and that was one of the reasons for the dinner too, just to eat with them again and be there with them. That's, that's what the closeness is about, that they're there with us. And, uh, and uh, not only that, too, you know, I do have family up there. I've got my mother and my grandmother and my sisters and uh, grandfather, great-grandfather, all, all there. So that I have a, I have a big dinner when I <laughs> sit down with those guys, you know. So I, I just wanted to please, if you would, come out there and see for yourself and get the feeling of what we're speaking of. You know, it's... it's it's what you got to do is experience it and that and if you can physically do that I'd, I'd appreciate it if you come out there and, and just come up and say hello to either, any one of us that are up there just introduce yourself let us know where you came from and you're welcome that's what we want to say too you're welcome to be there <laughs> oh and you'll, i hope you don't have any questions <laughs> i'm sure there's questions oh come on <laughs> I'll answer one, Let me, if it isn't too hard. Do oh, anybody ready. have questions? He's ready. <laughs> bring it. If you have one. Hey, Dad, I think Mom should answer the question. Yes. No. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So if you have a question, yes. I noticed one of the ancestors that you uh, posted there is a Caroline um, Cuero. Is uh -huh. there any relation to Delfino Cuero? Delfino Cuero? You know, that's a good question. I have no idea. <laughs> I've been doing a lot of um, research on ancestry from the census you know, from 1880s and on and I'm I think I, I've only seen her on one census and she passed away in Imperial Valley uh, my grandfather and brought her back the farmer that they worked for brought her back and buried her in Hamul and uh, you know she had eight children and uh, my grandmother was one of them and uh, she, she's hard to track and I guess maybe at that time um, there must have been so much movement that they had no permanent residence. And, you know, I know primarily we were in the Hillsdale area of Rancho San Diego. And that's where, that's where she was born. And that Delfino book too is, uh, yeah, she's in there, but my aunt, my aunt uh, Rosie Pinto's in there. And there's uh, another lady named Isabel Thing, which is, Jane Dumas' mom, I don't know if you all know Jane Dumas, is one of our elders that a lot of people in the community knew who she was, tribal member of Hamu, and also knowledgeable in all plants that were used for healing, because that's what her mother did when I was a kid, and Carlene when we were kids. Uh, we never went to see the doctor, we went to see the, the shaman, the, the woman that would heal you with using leaves or giving you some kind of drink of some sort. But uh, that's Jane Dumas' mom, Isabel Thing, that's in there. And the person that wrote the book was Florence Shipek. I don't know if you know Florence Shipek. She's one of the, uh, I don't know what her title is, archeologist. But she, she, uh, she was a shadow to my dad and my, my Aunt Rosie. So everywhere she went, Mrs. Shipek was right there with him, driving in the car, walking somewhere. She was right there writing down things and history about us. And uh, if you go to Saquon or want to do research, I guess there's Mr. Shipek, her son, has turned all the documents over to Saquon Museum. So if there's ever time you want to go do some research and, and look at those papers, you're able to do that. 
of course, with permission from them there at the, at the uh, museum. But I, I just wanted to enlighten you that a little bit. But if you read that book, that tells a little bit about what the community life was all about and all the foods that we used to eat. And you talk about it to some of the young people now, and they just they, they will not go there with that kind of food that we used to eat. You know, crawdads, that was a delicacy for us to eat. And uh, the crawfish, or whatever you want to call it, the crawdads. And I do it. I look at it now. I couldn't do it either. So, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but they ate all kinds of stuff. I mean, uh, you, you know those rats that are in a tree that build that big old nest in there. They're they're tree rats or something. Rats. One of my uncles looked at me. Who was it? Wood rat. Wood rat. One of my uncles was looking at me. He says, "Have you ever eaten one of those?" And I, no, I haven't. And he says, "Well, you, you got to eat one. It's really good. I'll cook it up for you." <laughs> No, I stop at cottontail rabbits. That's where I. Eat. That's good enough for me. So, and 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 if you ever tried rattlesnake, try that. If you haven't had a chance to try it, have somebody cook it up for you that knows what they're doing. Rattlesnake is a very tasty piece of meat. <laughs> and anyway, I just wanted to mention that about the Delphina book that you just brought up. So, uh, if you guys get a chance, please read 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 the read the book. Gives a little bit more insight about the Kumeyaay people. Yes. Thank you very much for speaking with us and sharing your knowledge today. I wanted to ask you about, uh, you mentioned at the very beginning of the talk about this relationship you have with Catholicism mm -hmm. and, and the spirituality from the Kumeyaay ancient spirituality and how did you? live with those two worlds because we know we know I'm, I'm Mexican you know the Virgin of Guadalupe of course is Tonatzin of course is uh, her mother uh, and it's always this duality right always there's a meaning underneath uh, what is acceptable or what was acceptable you know when I was growing up you know I um, my mom we were Catholic we, we went to church but it wasn't all the time but we lived in a community where people would be driving around saying, hey, we got this, we got the um, uh, Baptist church, and then there was this uh, other church that was there, and they would grab the kids. If, hey, mom and dad are not going to church. Why don't we bring you kids here to the church, you know? And I saw that, you know, the Baptist and the uh, Pentecostal church. That was another church that I went to. And I go, why are there so many religions, I, even though they're all talking about God? Why do the Baptists believe in this way and the Pentecostal people are in this way? And that was the first time, too, when I went into church because we were real quiet in the Catholic church. And here you're sitting in this other church and they go, hey, man, praise the Lord. <laughs> you look over at this guy, what was that all about, you know? <laughs> so, but I, I, I was just torn between why are there so many? And, and then those people come to the door that, the tower or whatever that that magazine they that's what I asked them too I says why are there so many churches why are, we're all talking about God why are we not all have one church that we all believe in God what's what's the deal here and then one time too I got real sick and um, I met this black girl that knew about the Bible I mean she knew inside out I mean she was young and I, I was in the hospital and the uh, I just was joking with her. I go, what are you doing here on a Saturday night when you're young and you should be out somewhere enjoying yourself? She took, gave me a rundown of her life, and it was tough, and it was rough. She was a young black girl that came out, and, and now she believes in God. She knows the Bible inside out, and she was quoting things to me that I did not know. And uh, I told her, too. I said, you know, when I get out of here, I want to come to your church. I want to listen to your, your people talk. But before I did that, I was at home, laying at home, the priest got there, so I thought I'd share this with him. I said, hey, I met this girl, da da da, went the whole thing, and, and I said, I want to go to the church and I want to I wanna listen to these people. And the father turned around and told me, do not go to that church. Do not go to that church. He was like, he's scaring me a little bit, you know, I'm going, why would you say that? They're talking about God. I'm going to go learn about God because I feel in the Catholic everything was so quiet even though there was a Sunday class afterwards after all the mass was over you would go to 
Sunday school or something and learn about the Bible and God's way and all that. But I just, I just, I, was, I wasn't getting it. I wasn't, I wasn't comfortable with it. I wasn't, uh, there was all these churches and we're all talking about God. Why, why is so, why is the priest so negative? For me not to go to this church why is he like that i don't know it just puzzled me for the longest time and that's why i never really stressed to my kids if they wanted to go to church go to church if you don't want to go to church that's your choice and when i was first married carlene and i and mom and her mom they were catholics and they they looked at us like you got your kids here baptize them baptize them and we were looking at each other saying, well, we're all thinking this thought about how the church is these days, and we want them to grow up and make their own decision. If they want to be Catholics, then they're going to be Catholics. If they're going to be something else, and that, that, that's their choice. But mom and her mom, they just hounded us, hounded us, hounded us, and you know, we just said, let's baptize them, because th that's, that's the only way we're going to get my mom and her mom off our back. So we ended up baptizing every one of them. They're all Catholics. And a couple of them have uh, gone to church a few times. And I don't know. <laughs> well, I mean, they just decided, hey, I'm going to go to church. And they, and they did. They went to church for a while there. And um, they grew up. And, and some things set in their mind. And some of them stopped going. So that, that's what was puzzling to me, is that we have this religion. And we're supposed to be talking about this great being that saves us and we pray to him why can't I go to that church and pray to him too if that's what these people do the Baptist the, the, the Pentecostal church you know those people they, they're all praying to God I want to go there and pray to God why can't I now I stay home like those other people say I stay home and pray to God now I talk to God you know I don't uh, have to go over to the church and talk to them. They say, hey, you can stay home and do it now. You can stay home and talk to God and be there with God. And that's, that's what I do now. But like I said, I, I call him the creator now, something that's really huge, really big. That's the creator that created heaven and earth and all life. That's what I, that's what I, that's what I look at it as now, as the creator. But uh, yes, I'm caught between religion there for a while I didn't know I didn't know what to do but you see uh, my son uh, he went to a Sundance and they they don't they yeah they speak about spiritual stuff but the stuff they did to go through this dance was painful to see that you know because they got to do piercing they can't eat for four days they dance in a circle around a tree and they're blowing a whistle and they're they're by the fourth day when I talked to my son, he didn't look like he knew me because he was going through this change after not eating or drinking or sleeping too well. They did allow him to sleep, but they could not eat. But after that fourth day, they were just, I, I, I was afraid for my son because that's what he wanted to do. I gave him a lot of credit for it because it's painful and it's a really hard old deal to go through if you're gonna do the Sundance. And it's mainly up in the Dakotas and Montana area. All those people up there do that Sundance. And my son took it, took it upon himself to do that because some of these elders saw him and they said, we want to invite you to our Sundance. And you don't, you don't get that too often. Mm -hmm. It had to be something special about my son for them to ask him to do that. And he went and did it. So he did it five times. And after five times, he could do it again. But after five times, he can go in the circle now. He can be in there with them. He doesn't have to be doing the dances. He can help them out, smudge them, help them in any way he can, except, you know, if they need water, maybe give them a little bit, not too much. But uh, the thing was, and that's a very strong, strong dance, too, because if there's a woman in there and she happens to be in our monthly deal, that whole thing will come to a stop because the guys will start getting sick. And the medicine man came out and he just told everybody, women, I see you here, and if you're on that this monthly deal, please walk away, go way over there and stand over there. You can't be over here. You can't. There was a special reason for that, and, and sure enough, some ladies left, and 
Then the dance resumed. But the guys were getting sick, they were throwing up, and that's when he knew that he had to stop it and get these ladies out of here. But I mean, they're, they're strong beliefs, I mean. I mean, beliefs that I don't understand, you know, and, uh, and that's why I feel that maybe the Catholic religion, even though later on I found out more about the Catholic religion too, about the missions and how the Indians were treated, and, and you know, we were called mission Indians, Deganos, you know, from San Diego, Deganos. So they called us mission Indians because we built the missions or helped build the missions. So that's why we were identified. They, we were never called Kumeyaay until my Aunt Rosie brought it to our attention because of Florence Shipek. They talked among themselves and realized that, you know, we're not mission Indians. We're not Deganios. Who are you? What was our name? And Florence Shipek did her research and she said, this is, this is what it is. So my aunt brought it out. A lot accepted the name. Others didn't. They're saying, no, I'm Deganyo. I'm not Kumeyaay, I'm Deganyo. I'm a Deganyo Mission Indian. You look at him like, dude, get us an education here. You need to <laughs> write in your mind a little bit and realize. I try to explain it to him, too. Okay, if you're Deganyo and it's San Diego, what would we call before that? What would we call before these European people got here? I don't care, but Deganyo. He just went like that, yes. Can you translate for us what the meaning Kumeyaay Mm, there's a there's a few there's a the the people how how would we say it again the Kumeyaays they were called uh, Carly how do you oh, say I'm people <laughs> now what's what's the tr the terminology when we say Kumeyaay people do we call Deepai, them the people Ipai 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 that's that's what they call them but what are they the People of the South, people of the North. I, 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 for, I don't know this part of it because there, there's a lot of discussion going on this because they want to clarify more on what the Kumeyaay means, you know. So, yeah, so we, in our language, we call ourselves Dipai, meaning the Indian people are people. So, Kumeyaay, that I guess just covers the whole area for us in this area. There are Aboriginal territory, Kumeyaay people. Because you know, a lot of us, like I said, want to get away from the Deganyo recognition. And and when I went up north to talk to some of the Indians up there, you know, they got the Sioux and the Cheyenne and the Shoshone, all these big tribes that are all these. You see them on TV and all this other stuff. But when I went up there and said, "Yeah, my name is Jesse Pinto. I'm from uh, San Diego. I'm a Deganyo," they all looked at me like, "What's a Deganyo? Is, is that an is that an Indian?" They took me for, excuse me for saying, but they took me for a Mexican person. They just said, well, you, you look Mexican to us, you know. <laughs> okay. I've even gone to Hawaii, too, and the guy goes, you look Hawaiian, too. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, my brother and his family went there, and there's a, they're big guys, you know, and, they're, and that's what they brought him up to the front of the show in Hawaii, introduced his family, and then he goes, these are Native Americans. and, and, and Look at them. They look just like us. We're Hawaiian people, and these Native Americans right here, we could be brothers, you know. But uh, it, it's funny for them to identify us in that manner, so it makes me chuckle a little bit. But, uh, but anyway, um, your question. Yeah, that's what we're kicking around a little bit more and trying to define it more and get it down to where we can recognize and be all in agreement on what we're talking about here. Because like I said, a lot of the tribes out there, um, Lasagna, I'm, uh, uh, there's a Koopa tribe up there, and Laguna, uh, La Jolla Indians, and I don't know, what, what are they, Lasenos? Mm -hmm. Lasenos, you know, and th those are people that we're trying to open up a relationship with, which we do have, and we're all kicking it around, we're all trying to be on the same page that we are Indian people from San Diego, and now we're trying to identify, you know, what, who we actually are and what shared territories we, we're going through this map deal right now about where the Kumeyaay territory is, where the Lasagno tribe fits in over here and the Salton Sea over here because that was a shared territory too. So we can't really, we, the Kumeyaay people came, claim part of Salton Sea as our Aboriginal territory. <laughs> but you, these other people say, no, it's not, it's ours, you know, but we're, we're, we're trying to settle all that. It's, 
it's among ourselves that we're trying to settle these little disputes that we have now because of our history and and uh, and we're doing decolonization from the Museum of Man. I don't know if you guys know that we're getting all our artifacts back. We're getting our baskets back. We're getting um, a lot of things that the museum has and has had for decades. And you know, the history with working with the Museum of Man wasn't the greatest thing, but just lately we opened up a relationship now that is a more kinder group of people working there that I wanna say have a little heart and are, are compassionate to us that you should get your stuff back and that's what they're working towards and we are getting some, matter of fact, we just got a bunch of our baskets back. They were dated back to the latter part of the 1800s and early 1900s. All of those are our ancestors that had the museum had for them so many years that we finally got back. We got a pipe and a few other artifacts back that, I think Percy was part of it, helping us get that back too mm -hmm. for us. Oh, there you are. <laughs> <laughs> I saw you over there. But, yeah, <laughs> but that's that's that and that's us too. The tribe, the Kumeyaay tribe. We used to travel all over, just down the ocean, went up to the mountains, and we're down in the desert. You know, all the way close to the Colorado River. You know, we we would do that. We travel up to the north. We travel down to the south. You know, it all depends on what the weather's doing too. So. We just move along. But I just wanted to let you know that Kumeyaay people are everywhere in San Diego. <laughs> um, there are some people who are trying to think about ways to make dying and death practices less white and less European. And I'm wondering if there are certain practices that you, that Kumeyaay people would like to see restored. That's so funny you ask a question like that because we just had a couple of people pass in the last couple of years because we used to cremate and we don't do that norm just because of church. You know, church <coughs> says you're not to cremate, you're to bury. So that's what they did. They started burying when we used to cremate a long time ago. So now, just a few years ago, one of the tribal leaders from Manzanita, very well known person in that area, his name is Mr. Leroy Elliott. He was the first one to request that he wanted to be cremated. And they did it right there on their reservation because the Quachans and the Kukapas down there, they cremate and they do it right there on their land. They have a big cemetery there that they bring this person, they cremate them right there. And you can stand and watch if you wish, but that's not a good deal because it's bad medicine for you. But, uh, but uh, they, if your family, you can be there or you can be standing far distance and watch the whole thing take place. But the quick applause, the Quachon still do that. And now, after Leroy had passed, his brother, a year later, requested the same thing. So we've had two people so far in Kumeyaay territory be cremated when we stopped this many, many, many years ago because of the Catholic Church telling us that it's not a good idea. You'll go to hell. So. Yes, we want to bring it back. Some of us are thinking about maybe that's where we want to go there. But uh, for us in Hamul, maybe there's a few of us that think in that manner, but a lot of us, I think we, we have that cemetery. We just, got, we just got all that. We, no, I don't think we're going to go in that manner. I am not anyway. I mean, some of our tribal members, if they wish to do that, that's their, their decision. But right now, I, I'm saying no, I'm going to be buried <laughs> rather than be cremated but that that's an interesting question that you brought up because that was something that was kicked around for the longest time and then only this one guy came forward and said this is the way i want it this is the way you guys are going to do it for me so we did it for him and it was a big to do thing because a lot of the tribes from all over came to see this because they had not seen anybody be cremated in our area in, in the california area but quichons kookaburras right in that area the Mojaves along the Needles area, they all cremate, all of that. We don't, but we're, I think we're, some of us may be hidden in that direction now. Not all of us, but some of us. All right. Thank you for coming, you guys. I really Thank appreciate you. it. Thank you. <laughs>